Good afternoon, everyone. This morning, the Secretary General went to Yonsei University in Seoul to deliver remarks at the inaugural Global Engagement and Empowerment Forum on Sustainable Development. In his remarks, the Secretary General called for a new deal for fair globalization. He told the audience, which included former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the President of the General Assembly, that engagement is essential if you really want to transform the sustainable development goals into a blueprint that can be a basis for a new deal for fair globalization. He added that the combination of increased globalization and technological advancement has led to meaningful improvements in many people's lives, but has also dramatically increased inequality and left us with a number of tough problems to solve, youth unemployment being one of them. While at Yonsei University, the Secretary General had an opportunity to meet with his predecessor, Ban Ki-moon. The current and former Secretaries General, along with the President of the General Assembly, Miroslav Lashak, met with the Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea, Lee nak -yeon. Before leaving Yonsei University, the Secretary General met with representatives of the United Nations country team based in the Republic of Korea. Departing Seoul, the Secretary General and his delegation drove to the site of the Pyeongchang Olympic Winter Games. On site, he toured the Olympic village at Gangneung, where he is able to meet with a number of, of official of uh, uh, sorry a number of athletes, including Kayen Go, the first Singaporean ever to qualify for the Olympic Winter Games. The Secretary General also met and, and encouraged competitors from Switzerland, Hungary, and China. In the evening, the Secretary General attended the official dinner hosted by the President of the Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, for visiting dignitaries. Vladimir Vornkov, the head of the UN Office on Counterterrorism, briefed the Security Council on the Secretary General's recent report on the threat posed by Daesh. And he said that the fight against Daesh is entering a new phase. But despite setbacks in Iraq, Syria, and the southern Philippines, Daesh and its affiliates continue to pose a significant and evolving threat around the world. Daesh, he says, is no longer focused on conquering and holding territory. It has been forced to adapt and focus primarily on a smaller and more motivated group of individuals, and it is now organized as a global network with a flat hierarchy and less operational control over its affiliates. His remarks are available in our office. The Secretary General, along with his special envoy Nikolai Mladenov, would like to express their gratitude to the state of Qatar and the United Arab Emirates for their prompt and generous contributions to the urgent UN appeal aimed at averting an imminent humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. This contribution will ensure that the vulnerable people of Gaza are able to access life-saving health, water, and sanitation services. We must not forget, however, that to achieve a sustainable solution to the critical humanitarian and socioeconomic challenges that plague Gaza, it is critical to move forward with intra-Palestinian reconciliation on the basis of the recent agreement brokered by Egypt, including the return of Gaza under the control of the legitimate Palestinian Authority. I had been asked yesterday about the response by the UN interim force in Lebanon to Israeli construction activity near the Blue Line. I can tell you that according to UNIFIL, the Israeli Defense Force construction works are taking place south of the Blue Line and not in sensitive areas. UNIFIL leadership has been fully engaged with both parties in order to find a common solution to this issue. It is of paramount importance for the parties to take advantage of UNIFIL's liaison and coordination arrangements to find solutions aimed at preventing violations, decreasing tension, and maintaining stability. It's important to emphasize that during the tripartite meeting held in Ras al Nakura on the 5th of February, the Israeli Defense Forces and the Lebanese Armed Forces confirmed their commitment to further use the tripartite and liaison and coordination mechanisms to address any issues that could increase tension. UNIFIL's troops are on the ground to monitor the situation, which is calm. We remain deeply concerned by the continued intense fighting in eastern Ghouta and its impact on close to 400,000 civilians in the besieged enclave in Syria. Over the past 48 hours, intense airstrikes and shelling have reportedly resulted in scores of civilian deaths and injuries, as well as damage to civilian infrastructure, particularly in the towns of Duma, Hamuria, Gafirbatna, and Sawa. Meanwhile, since the 20th of January, tens of thousands of people have been displaced in Afrin due to ongoing hostilities, with 2,000 people being reported as displaced elsewhere in Aleppo governorate. While numbers inside Afrin are extremely difficult to verify, displaced people are reportedly sheltered in schools, mosques, and public buildings. The main needs of displaced people include food, medicine, and winter items. 
Today in Abuja, Edward Kalan, the humanitarian coordinator in Nigeria, launched the humanitarian response plan for the northeastern part of the country. The appeal is for $1.05 billion to reach 6.1 million people with assistance. Some 7.7 .7 million people need humanitarian assistance in the worst affected states of Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe. This includes 3.7 million people who are expected to be severely food insecure during the lean season starting in June. Mr. Kalon said these are people who have been displaced and are living in camps or host communities, people who have returned home to nothing, and people living in other areas that are hard to reach for humanitarians. The humanitarian crisis in Nigeria's northeast is one of the most severe in the world today and is now in its ninth year. Our colleagues in the Food and Agriculture Organization today launched a $1.06 billion appeal to help vulnerable communities in 26 countries fight back against hunger. The agency hopes to reach some 30 million people who rely on agriculture and have been affected by climate-related shocks in countries like Bangladesh, Somalia, and Yemen. It will do this through activities that include providing seeds, tools, and other materials for crop farming, providing veterinary care for livestock, land and water management, and giving at-need families cash so they can immediately access food. More information on the appeal is available on FAO's website. Today, in the Economic and Social Council Chamber, countries are celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. The actual day is on the 11th of February. In a video message, the Secretary General told attendees that while both boys and girls have the potential to pursue ambitions in science, systematic discrimination means women occupy less than 30% of research and development jobs worldwide. He said efforts are needed to overcome stereotypes and biases and stress the need to support and invest in women as scientists and innovators. His message is online. And thanks today go to Morocco, which has paid its 2018 regular budget dues. The honor roll total is now 45. Uh, a reminder that correspondents are invited to a screening and discussion of the film Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora, this evening from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. in conference room four. And I have an appointment. Today, the Secretary General is appointing Lisa Filippetto of Australia as head of the UN Support Office in Somalia, known as UNSOS. Ms. Filippetto will succeed Hubert Price, to whom the Secretary General expresses his gratitude for his dedication and effective leadership of UNSOS. And, and Hubert Price is, in fact, my guest today. Ms. Filippetto brings to this position more than 30 years of experience within the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where she served in a variety of posts at headquarters, including as Assistant Secretary General of European Union and Western Europe branch. And we have more details in my office. And uh, like I said, I'll be joined by Hubert Price shortly. Uh, before we get to him, are there any questions for me? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, this is Imran Ansari. I would like to draw your attention to Bangladesh. You may know, know that former Prime Minister of Bangladesh and key opposition leader Begum Khalid Azia was jailed for five years for corruption. After her verdict, tens of millions, thousands of people come to the street to protest. And against this political motivated verdict, police imposed 144 and used live bullet to demolish this protest. Thousands of opposition activists being arrested as part of the media report. You may know that general ele election will be held this upcoming December. And political expert already told to the media after his verdict, it is the process to eradicate Begum Khalid Azia and her son, Tariq Rahman, uh, from the general election. In this connection, what types of initiative taken by Secretary General and could he send any special envoy to Bangladesh to resolve the political crisis? Uh, well, first of all, we only recently received uh, the reports concerning uh, the uh, arrest uh, and uh, the subsequent events. We're monitoring what uh, the events are on the ground and we will react accordingly. We would, of course, be concerned about uh, any reports of violence. And at this point, we call on all sides to maintain calm. And we expect to have a further reaction after we've evaluated the situation further. Uh, Edie? Uh, two questions, Farhan. Does the Secretary General have any comment on the um, attack by the US-led coalition in Syria that has killed dozens of Syrian troops? 
and secondly, um, the UN humanitarian chief, Mark Lowcock, is briefing the Security Council on the Syrian humanitarian affair behind closed doors. Is there any way of getting him to the stakeout to talk to us and tell us what he told the council? Uh, I don't know whether he would himself be willing to come to the council, but uh, we uh, provided some of the details of the humanitarian situation in Syria in, in my notes just now, and that is in keeping with some of the things that he is expected to brief the Security Council about. Uh, he, by the way, his, um, uh, Mr. Lowcock's briefing uh, also uh, uh, concerns the call that came out uh, from the humanitarian coordinator uh, two days ago for uh, a ceasefire of what we hoped would be uh, at least one month. That's correct, but could you uh, please pass on a request from the media that we would appreciate his stopping at the stakeout? I will, I will do so as soon as I get out of this, uh, this room. Uh, yes, uh, Majid. Thank you, Farhan. Um, about that the UN call for 30 days ceasefire in Syria. The Russian ambassador just said, just uh, said that that call is unrealistic. What is your comment about that? Uh, we have made clear what our concerns about the violence are. Uh, we have also made clear uh, the reasoning behind this. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a cessation of hostilities in key parts of the country so that we can better gain access for humanitarian aid and so that we can evacuate people who are in desperate need of medical help. Uh, we've done this several times in the past. Uh, sometimes it's worked, sometimes it has not, but uh, it's gotten to one of the points when it, where it is a crucial point, and this is what uh, Mr. Lowcock is discussing with the Security Council. Any official response from, from Russia, Turkey, U.S., the countries who are engaged in military activities in Syria about this call? Well, I mean, uh, they, they, they can comment as, as they see fit. To the U.S. Uh, what we are trying to do, uh, like I said, is see what can be done uh, to get a cessation of hostilities as soon as possible. Yes? Farhan, yeah. you didn't answer the first part of my question about the coalition airstrike. Uh, we have no first-hand information about this. Obviously, we're concerned about uh, uh, any of the violence uh, on the ground. And, uh, and as I've said, what we're aiming for is to see whether there can be some sort of temporary halt brought about. Yes. Question on Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe's new president, Emerson Nangagwa, said earlier this year that they would welcome UN uh, obser observers in the upcoming uh, presidential and parliamentary elections in the middle of this year. Have there been any contacts uh, in that regard with the Zimbabwe government and, and the UN? Uh, I'm not aware of any formal request. Obviously, uh, once we receive formal requests, uh, we evaluate them and see what kind of help can be provided. But there's, uh, there's no detail on that at this stage. Yes, uh, uh, al Fazl. Thank you, Mr. Fahan. Uh, just I will supple supplement my colleague as he said this current situation on Bangladesh. The, do you, from this podium, many times you said, and the Secretary General is urging for inclusive and participatory election. But with this verdict of the main opposition back on Khaledas, yeah, do you think still there is a hope to hold a free, fair, and credible election, inclusive election in Bangladesh? One. Second question is, Bangladesh, do you think the role of law in currently Bangladesh prevailing, the role of law, law is established because the Chief Justice forced to leave the country? And the role of law is, uh, the judiciary is very controversial. So what is your comment about this verdict on main opposition, Begum Khaled Azia and his, her son, Tariq Rahman? Well, as, as I just mentioned, we're just monitoring what the latest developments regarding this verdict are. And we expect that we'll uh, say something more once we've evaluated the situation. It's, uh, it's too early to judge what impact uh, this will have. But uh, yes, we do continue uh, to call for uh, an inclusive and democratic process in the country. Yes, Masood. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for, for this uh, SOF situation in Egypt is concerned with the, with the aid of the Israelis. Uh, they are taking, uh, routing the so-called uh, oppositions everywhere. And they are, and the CC government is arresting the opposition leaders. Has the Secretary General got to say anything about that? Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the, the most recent uh, actions taken by the government. You'll, you'll have seen our previous concerns expressed, but I don't have anything new to add on that. Uh, yes, Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Farhan. 
uh, Aziz, uh, 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 with regard to the situation in Maldives, how has the President of Maldives reacted to the UN offer to ease the crisis resulting from his actions, uh, which uh, the uh, human rights chief described as assault on democracy? Uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, the position of the president, but what I can tell you is that our assistant secretary general for political affairs, Miroslav Yencha, did speak with the foreign minister of the Maldives uh, two days ago to relay what our concerns have been. Uh, you saw the statement issued uh, by the secretary general, and, and we made uh, those points uh, directly to the government. Uh, Errol. that we are witnessing on a daily basis that uh, uh, many countries are now, especially in Europe and here in the United States, are concerned about mangling in the domestic elections. Uh, what does the Secretary General think? How high is that in his box of concerns, global concerns? And what does he say? And what does he uh, probably plan to address or so on that issue? Uh, on, on which issue? Uh, please repeat. Excuse me? Uh, could, could you please repeat your question? Okay. In the light of the uh, concerns of mendeling foreign powers, mendeling in elections of oh, another mendeling. country. Uh, mendeling, yes. Yeah. Sorry, for my yes. English is only my second language. <laughs> yes. The Secretary General thinks about that. Is that in his box of concerns or so? It's clear for us that we want all elections to be decided by the voters in the respective countries in which those elections are held. And, and we hope for free and fair democratic processes wherever they're held. Yes. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, obviously, there are some concrete, uh, not only concerns, but allegations that uh, Russia is on the top of those countries who are interfering in other countries' election in Europe and here in the United States. What does the Secretary General say? He's a champion of democracy and the free and fair elections are the main tool of that democracy. Well, I, I just repeat what I'd, I'd said. Uh, ultimately, our goal is for everywhere for there to be free and fair elections in which elections are decided strictly by the country's voters. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. I have two questions, one on Iran and one on Libya. In Iran, an 81-year-old former UNICEF diplomat, his name is Bakr Namazi. Namazi. Uh, he was taken back to prison after he had a, a leave of uh, medical leave from prison for heart uh, problems. So he was taken back to prison. Is there any statement, or are you aware of what happened to Bakr? Uh, yes, uh, what I can say is we understand that former UNICEF staff member Bakr Namazi has been returned to Elvin prison after his medical release on the 28th of January. UNICEF is deeply concerned about Mr. Namazi's deteriorating health and continues to urge the Iranian government to grant him a full and unconditional release on humanitarian grounds. Mr. Namazi is 81 years old and has been detained in, Iraq, in, in Iran for almost two years and is in increasingly poor health. He was most recently admitted to hospital on the 15th of January, and his, that was his fourth hospitalization in the past 12 months. Good. I'm glad that you had a statement. Yeah. At least. The second question, the uh, panel of experts on Libya had documented some secret relations between the security forces in Tripoli and the gangs who are responsible for immigrant smuggling and smuggling other merchandise. I mean, the uh, report has been leaked out to the press. Do you have any comment on that? Well, we don't have any first-hand information about these reports, but uh, certainly we have called for uh, there to be an end to any sort of um, cooperation between uh, governments and, and human trafficking networks. And we believe all governments should work against that, uh, uh, and we will press all of them uh, on that. Yes, you and then you. Thanks. So I wanted to fi first to follow up on, on, on Bangladesh. I mean, you'd said it, it, this arrest took place some time ago, and various countries have put out already travel warnings. So I'm wondering, at a minimum, does the, I mean, the UN, with its country team there, have they taken 
note of what's taking uh, place I've, in the street? I've, I've told you what I've got on that. And right given that there's live fire, you say we well, very recently DPKO put out a statement thanking Bangladesh for its peacekeepers, and I'm sure they've done great work, but there's been a repeated issues of abuses by the security forces or seeming abuses, killing of civilians, use of live fire on protesters. Can you describe what, what vetting goes on and, and the recent uh, a spate of, of these thank you messages uh, put out by DPKO, are they in any relation to, to, to the vetting process that's going on or issues that have arisen in various delegations, you know, con contingents of peacekeepers? It, all peacekeepers are vetted to make sure that they uh, have not engaged in any, uh, in any practices that uh, involve the violation of human rights, and we go through that on a country-by-country -country basis. And so have there been any Bangladesh peacekeepers blocked in the last five years, given the events in the country, in which ver units by name have taken place in crackdowns uh, on their own we, civilians? We, uh, we raise all concerns with any particular members of uh, incoming peacekeeping troops with the troop contributing country to make sure that, uh, that no one is deployed who does not meet our standards. Yes, Pam. Uh, the Secretary General, before he left uh, for the, the Olympic Games, said he, it was absolutely essential for nations to be, be involved in serious talks uh, in order to defuse the nuclear crisis mm -hmm. in North Korea. And there was some indication perhaps he would consider meeting with the North Koreans. Is there anything on that? Uh, there's nothing to announce at, at this stage, no. And, but is he encouraging countries to si have talks on the sidelines? Uh, he, he is encouraging uh, there to be dialogue in, uh, on all the issues involving the Korean Peninsula. And indeed, uh, in, a, in an interview he gave earlier today, he once more uh, made a call for that sort of dialogue. And uh, any sort of occasion can be useful for that, including this one. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Farhan, a follow up on Edith's uh, question. So uh, regarding the uh, American coalition and the strikes in Syria, um, do you, to which extent you are informed uh, for humanitarian um, reasons when s uh, such strikes are taking place? And uh, when you say you cannot verify the information, is it because you don't have enough uh, people on the ground, you don't have anyone all at all, or partners, or can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, we, we don't have the first-hand presence uh, that would allow us to do that. At the same time, uh, we do inform all of the various parties about uh, the presence of our humanitarian workers, our humanitarian facilities, uh, and when we uh, travel to different areas, we get uh, our travel cleared uh, by all the various parties you know, on the ground as well as, uh, as the powers conducting military operations. Yes, Carla. Thank you. Um, in view of the fact that the Secretary General is encouraging uh, dialogue Overt or covert uh, during the Olympic Games, um, is does he or the UN have any comment upon the fact that uh, Vice President Pence has announced even more uh, cruel and draconian sanctions on North Korea, despite the fact that the United Nations rapporteurs on human rights have uh, stated their alarm about the humanitarian consequences of the current sanctions. And how does that impact upon any chance of dialogue? And as a follow-up, since the president of North Korea is sending his uh, sister, and since President Trump is sending his daughter, is there any hope of dialogue among the two family members? Well, that's really a question to ask the respective governments. Uh, regarding your, your first question, we don't have any comment on the bilateral measures being taken. Yes, Masood. Yeah, uh, on this, uh, about uh, Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, charges by the International Red Cross that uh, the Saudi-led coalition is not allowing enough humanitarian aid in, in, uh, to Yemen, and there are people dying in the hospitals without uh, essential supplies. Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, has anybody dealt or talked to the Saudis about allowing this humanitarian aid, especially the medical aid, to go through? Yes, we, we, we continue to be in touch with uh, uh, the various parties, including the coalition, to get as much access as possible. Uh, of course, uh, there has been some access to Yemen, but, uh, but we're continuing to try to expand that. Yes. Farhan, um, how much is uh, 
on, on, his, on the Secretary General agenda this year, at the beginning of this year, the question of Cyprus. As we know, he was very enthusiastic at the beginning of his tenure. What's going on now? Well, he continues to be advised, uh, including from uh, 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 Elizabeth Spehar, who is our senior official currently dealing with the Cyprus file, about all the events, and, uh, and he continues uh, to see what uh, influence we can have to bring the, the talks forward. Also, if I, if I may, yeah. in that region, uh, is Secretary General fully advised on the situation, on the negotiation, on the changing of the name of the former Republic of Macedonia? Uh, yes, uh, yes, of course. He's been in touch with Mr. Nimitz uh, about that topic. And now, uh, yes, one more. Yeah, actually, I, well, I have two, and I will. I got a guest. Well, all right. First, I want to ask you about the Bur what I asked you yesterday: Burundi and UNFPA. I'm aware that the UN is aware that there are many people, not only in Burundi, asking why it would be that the UN system would be giving money and equipment to the wife of a controversial president of Burundi, which is cracking down on the press. So I'm wondering. One, do you have an answer yet? Or two, the, de no. the, the Deputy Secretary General is meeting with the head of UNFPA today at 2.45. Do you expect this to be an issue to come up, and can there be a readout of that meeting? No, we don't have readouts of meetings with agency heads. Uh, but uh, I have inquired uh, to the UN Population Fund about this, and I'm awaiting their reply. And on Honduras, what is the UN's role in Honduras? It's reported that Mr. Nasrallah is meeting with a team that was sent there. Is the government, who is it that's invited this mediation team of the UN, and what is its mandate? Uh, I don't have any particular details to share about a mediation team at this stage. Uh, we'll see what we can say about a UN role as that progresses. The names Thanks. of the people have been published.